Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House, where we always aim to please. And uh, we have a really, really good show tonight. Welcome, Reverend Michael Dowd and Jennifer Hines. Um, and we have a great group. It looks like we have quite a few people. If anybody on Facebook would like to help us out and share to all the groups, that would be phenomenal. Um, I, uh, I just want to say, Michael, I have enjoyed listening to your SoundCloud version, uh, your narration of this book over the last several months as I went back and forth. And I'm going to start out with uh, just this little piece here of William Catton, who believed that industrial uh, civilization had sown the seeds of its own demise and that humanity's seeming dominance of the biosphere is only, only a prelude to decline. And so I'm going to give it to Jennifer. Yeah. And Jennifer, you can do the welcoming uh, only the way you can. Well, we are so pleased to have you again here tonight at Environmental Coffee House. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. 41 years ago, William Catton wrote an absolutely pivotal book, Overshoot, which we're going to be discussing tonight. And you have actually uh, recorded uh, a live SoundCloud and you are self described as Catton's Bulldog. So, um, with that, Michael, welcome to Environmental Coffee House. We're so happy to have you again, second time. Yes. Well, Sandy and Jennifer, I've just got to say at the start that you are two of my most cherished colleagues <laughs> in this post doom world. Uh, well, beyond collapse, beyond collapse, it's really not just about doom. It's about really post-doom. It's about how to stay inspired, how to stay in a place of love and action, how to stay in a place of compassionate, generous contribution in the midst of a declining industrial civilization that's mm -hmm. destined to extinction in terms of homo colossus, in terms of uh, William Catton's terms, and the possible extinction of, uh, of homo sapiens. And so I just cherish the opportunity to be in a conversation with both of you. And certainly, uh, yes, I've only just actually within the last maybe two months begun to speak of myself as Catton's bulldog. And of course, Huxley famously referred to himself as Darwin's bulldog because he was so evangelistic about about Charles Darwin's work, that he was the, the the foremost popularizer of Charles Darwin, and so I I I don't know if I'm the foremost popularizer, but I certainly want to be. If the only thing I'm ever known for the rest of my life, seriously, is promoting William Catton's overshoot, the ecological basis of revolutionary change, I will have died. A glorious death if that's the only thing i do the rest of my life it's that important it's the single most important book that i've ever read in my life it's the single most important book connie's ever read in her life um my wife is a science writer uh, uh paul ehrlich Derek jensen and many others consider it the most important book of the 20th century and so it's an honor to speak the, to the two of you and have a discussion about william catton's book overshoot well, it's great to have you here. Um, I had the most amazing experience going through and kind of cramming for this session <laughs> that we're going through today. And uh, I had initially listened to, I guess, the first part of the three-part recording that you did. And uh, it's a most significant book. So, um, Michael, this is your show, so go ahead and, and take it away and cover some of the really salient points that you'd like us to all pay attention to. Wow. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Well, the, the first thing I would say is this, and I'll probably say this at the end as well. A cue. A cue before questions, that's all. If you only read one book the rest of your life, I invite you to read William Catton's masterful, paradigm-shattering book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. It's available. You can get used copies on Amazon paperback quite inexpensively, under 20 bucks. I've recorded the entire thing, audio. Now, the, the, there's also been an official audiobook. So if you go to audible.com and you 
put in William Catton's Overshoot, you'll find that there's an actor that actually recorded a version of Overshoot that's only 11 and a half hours long. Mine's like 14 and a half hours long. Like, what's the deal? Well, I regularly say, now that paragraph was so great, I'm going to read it again. So I do that, <laughs> you know. And it's and, good and, when you do that. And, yeah. and by the way, I just have to tell you, I do have the Audible version, and I have listened to at least the th <laughs> per first third of yours. And yours, honestly, is much more palatable and much oh, yeah. better because I can feel the energy. I can feel the meaning coming through your words. Absolutely. And I couldn't really listen to that actor reading it nearly as well. As, <laughs> no, as it was you, awful. Honestly. Well, your I, voice I, I so one. appreciate both of you for saying that. I mean, I, I, I too have listened to the entirety, uh, actually twice, of the actor version, and uh, you know, no, not disparaging him at all. I mean, he did a good job, but mm -hmm. uh, for me, I was so connect. Okay, I got to tell you my favorite story, and I almost never get to share this. So this is this is really inspiring for me to be able to share it with you and share and those it. who are on the Environmental Coffee House. Mm -hmm. So. How did I discover William Catton's Overshoot? So for 12 years, I mean, I've been involved in the universe story or epic of evolution or big history since the late 1980s. Thomas Berry was one of my major mentors in yes. 1988. And I was involved in permaculture and bioregionalism and ecofeminism and deep ecology and all this really great earth honoring stuff. And then in the year 2000, I read several books, and I don't want to disparage the author, so I'm not going to mention which books they were, but I read several, actually four books, that put me on a techno-optimist, what, what William Catton would call cargoist, and I'll describe that term in a bit here, but, but a unidirectional, human-centered understanding of evolution and of history. And so from early 2000 until December 3rd of 2012, I was a cargoist. I basically had a human-centered, one, you know, with a greater complexity, interdependence, and cooperation at greater and larger scale. My book, Earth Spirit, basically presented an ecological worldview. But by the time I wrote my second book, which became an, a bestseller, Thank God for Evolution, which was endorsed by six Nobel Prize winning scientists and 120 religious leaders. I had already been on this techno optimist. So I don't even recommend my own book. My book was endorsed by six Nobel Prize winning scientists. I don't recommend it because I only agree with 90% of it. And the 10% I don't agree with, I so don't agree with that I can't even recommend my own book. And oh what happened goodness. was I, I didn't I didn't get Catton. I didn't get overshoot. I didn't get abrupt climate change. And when you combine what we now know, not believe, but what we know about abrupt climate change, as the two of you know, because of what this whole channel is all about, which is that abrupt climate change is like 10,000 years of climate change in a, in a half a human lifetime. When you combine that with Catton's understanding of carrying capacity, overshoot, ghost acreage and all the other major concepts that he offers in that book that's a total paradigm shift it's the shift from thinking in terms of cornucopia that were the the myth of perpetual progress to the ecological paradigm recognizing that limits are sacred and must be honored if anything is sacred limits are and that what we've been doing for seven thousand years roughly is dishonoring limits i i see that as mythically the fall our fall from the garden, our fall from living indigenously, our fall from living genuinely sustainably, that is an intimate, personal, humble relationship with the body of life upon which we depend and of which we are a part. Our fall from that was human-centeredness, anthropocentrism. It was dishonoring limits. And once we shift to that human-centered worldview, we put ourselves in a track that would eventually lead to right where we are now which is despoiling the air, the water, the soil, the life upon which we depend, and thinking that that's progress. That's the insanity. Progr Human-centered progress, that is progress in terms of GNP, in terms of individual wealth, nation wealth, all the things that we measure progress in, Without factoring in what's happening to the air, the water, the soil, the climate, the carbon, the other species, is total insanity. 
And yet that's precisely where we've been. And it wasn't until I read William Catton's book, Overshoot. So let me tell the story. Early 2015, I had been recording many of John Michael Greer's books and Richard Heinberg and other people that are in this sort of space of collapse and all that kind of stuff, rise and fall of civilization. And I had recorded, I don't know, two or 300 of John Michael Greer's posts, Archdruid Report posts, because he, he really specializes in ecology, energy, and history. And you can't understand our world and why we're in the mess we are without understanding ecology, energy, and history. That's what Catton does brilliantly. And so I was reading his November of 2011, I forget what date, but sometime in November of 2011, he wrote a post. Now, I was reading this in early 2015, January 2015, and it was called A Gathering of the Tribe. And he talked about being at an ESPO, ESPO conference, a peak oil conference, and he said, I had dinner with William Catton, who wrote the book Overshoot. And he said, I, I tried my, my heart artist to a 14 year old in the presence of a rock star and i'm recording this with the same microphone that i'm recording this conversation right now and connie was on the couch and my eyes got big and i looked at hers her eyes got big and we both had the same thought at the same time which was there's nobody on the fucking planet that we hold in higher esteem than john michael greer so whoever he's holding up like that we better read so about an hour later, I ordered William Catton's Overshoot on Amazon, and it came in the mail, you know, two or three days later. And I was like 15, 20 pages into the book, and I started bawling. And I thought to myself, when I go to my grave, I'm going to feel that this is the most important book I've ever read in my life. Michael, didn't you tear up a little bit during your reading? Well, uh, I, I seriously te teared up at the at the end of chapter yeah, four. Yeah, I heard. But that it. was only a week or two later. Yeah, no, exactly. In fact, I, I got to tell you a fun story, Sandy. So one of the people I've influenced is this Pentecostal preacher who became an atheist preacher, uh, Jerry Dewitt. He wrote a book. I forget what it's called now, but but he, he I mean, he was one of the main. He was a Pentecostal preacher for twenty five years. He got turned on to the new atheists, and. Then he, he sort of, he, he, he lost his faith. He, like a dumb shit, he put it on Facebook. He was with Richard uh, Dawkins in, at a, an event in Houston. And he, he was the chief of staff of his uh, mayor in his little town. And he had pastored for 25 years, his little Pentecostal church. Both of them collapsed that week. And so I turned him on to William Catton's overshoot. So he said, he, he told me, he says, I was driving down, I forget what, some freeway in, in North America, some interstate. And he said, I heard your voice starting to crack towards the end of chapter four or five or whatever it was. And he said, he said, my own eyes started getting moist. And he said, by the time I got to the end of the chapter, I had to pull over. He said, because you were crying, I could hear Connie crying on the couch and I couldn't even see. Oh, yeah. Michael. <laughs> but that's the nice thing about the uh, that's the nice thing about recording the unofficial audio of a mm -hmm. book. And I've recorded like two dozen books. You can find them all if you just Google Michael Dowd SoundCloud or Grace Limits SoundCloud. You can get all. They're all freely available. But I've recorded so many, like twelve or well, no, maybe ten of John Michael Greer's books and Richard Heinberg and and Ke William Catton and so many others. My point is this, is that when I read even the first 15 chapters, I mean, the first 15 pages of Cat, I knew that this would be the most significant book I'd ever read in my life. And oh, I feel the, the, next, the, I the, feel next, the same way. Yeah. The next <laughs> day, Connie and I went to a friend and colleague of ours who's the director of the first Ph.D. program in the United States on religion and ecology. Bron Taylor is his name. He wrote a book called Dark Green Religion, which is absolutely kick-ass. Wow. And we, we went to his house, because he's a friend, and he saw me reading Catton's Overshoot. He saw this laying on the table, and he said, oh, my God, you're reading Overshoot. <laughs> he's, he said, Dave Foreman, who founded Earth First, yeah. had given me a copy of Catton, and he said it was the most important book he'd ever read in his life. Wow. And I said, wow. that's exactly what I'm feeling. Wow. And I said, well, did you hear he just died last week? Oh and I was like, God. what? And so I Googled, and it turned out he had died a week and a half earlier, but he had died in New Zealand. 
And I'm looking around. I can't find a single obituary. Yeah. I can't find it was, anything. It was 88. And so I'm looking. 87, 88. 88. Yeah, I think it was 88. Yeah, yeah. life. Yeah. No, exactly. But the bizarre thing was that somebody who's like, many of us consider the most significant author of the 20th century that he could die and nobody had written an obituary. There wasn't something in the New York times, the Washington post or anyone else. So I thought this is weird. So I, I Googled around and I found his grandson was a meteorologist and a physicist who lived in New Zealand. And that's where he had died. I found out. So I, I con I contacted him. I got his contact information. I Skyped him middle of the day. I figured out the time zone difference and he answered the phone. Oh, no way. And I said, I'm, I said, I'm Michael Dowd. I said, I've just read your grandfather's book. I said, it's the most important book I've ever read in my life. I just heard that he died. In fact, I'm not even finished the book. I'm only halfway in the book, but I just heard that he died. Is it true? He said, not only is it true, my grandmother and my grandfather flew here from Washington, the state of Washington, which is where they lived, uh -huh. for my wedding. Oh, oh! They died. He died four days oh, after my wedding. But at least his body's he still there. here. His but body he, has oh. his body hasn't even been sent to the United States yet, and that's why nobody knew that he died. Oh so then I God. called John Michael Greer up because I happened to have his number because I'd interviewed him for a series I did a couple of years earlier, and I said, "Did you hear William Catton died?" And he said, "No." Oh. And I said, well, I, I would normally wouldn't ask you of this because, uh, as you probably know, John Michael Greer is Asperger's, and he, he, he's public about that, but he doesn't do emotions a lot. And I, I said, would you be willing to write a tribute post to William Catton? I, I normally wouldn't ask this of somebody, but I know how significant he was for you. And he breathed, and he said, well, he said, no, you're right. I don't normally do this. He said, but you're also right. Catton was one of the most important authors I've ever read. He said, I'll consider it. Let's just put it that way. I'll consider it. I talked to him on a Friday. On Wednesday, the following Wednesday, he came out with a post titled, As Night Draws Closer, or As Night Draws In, or something like that. And it is, what is it? As night closes, as in. Night closes, closes in. That's in. it. As night closes in. Uh -huh. And it is the most awesome tribute. And he says at the very first sentence, he said, I learned uh -huh. of William Catton's passing from a fellow author, blah, 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 blah. Uh -huh. and, and it is so, and, and of course, like 60,000 people every Wednesday were waiting for John Michael Greer to publish his post. He was a mm -hmm. very well, so Richard Heinberg wrote a post the next day. Kurt Cobb wrote a post. Uh, uh, everybody. Uh, everybody got it. Everybody you started, started writing it. these tributes posts. Yeah, Thank exactly. you, Michael. Oh, God. Well, it was just this like amazing universe conspiring on my behalf timing that I happened to be reading the book. Oh, I happened God. to go to Braun Taylor's house. He happened to tell me, did you hear Catton just died a week and a half ago? It was like, oh, oh my God. So at any rate, yes, I will say this. I don't know any other book that the entire core content of the book can be found on the cover. So, Sandy, why don't you go ahead and show the cover? And I'm just going to read the cover and say how profoundly this captures the title of the book. So, Overshoot, the Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Chains. In fact, the way John Michael Greer says it, he's, he says he found this in a bookstore mm -hmm. in Seattle. And he said, I found the, I said, I read the cover of the book and I found the future staring me in the face. Wow. <laughs> Carrying capacity, maximum permanently supportable load. Cornucopian myth, euphoric belief in limitless resources. Drawdown, stealing resources from the future. Cargoism. Delusion that technology will always save us from overshoot mm. growth beyond one's beyond an area's carrying capacity, leading to crash, die off. And I've got to say that I have read that is physically read and marked up in my paperback copy, I think four times. And I have listened to my own recording of Catton's Overshoot probably seven or eight, nine times. And I've listened to the professional, uh, you know, actor who recorded it twice. So I think I've probably actually experienced Catton's Overshoot probably about a dozen times. 
And I would say roughly every six months I read it because nothing, no book ever published, in my opinion, and I've read thousands, and th I'm, I mean, that's what I am. I'm mm -hmm. an independent scholar. I've read thousands of books and hundreds of them relating to climate and collapse and overshoot and our ecological predicament and all that kind of stuff, resource depletion. None of them captures the big picture. Like this. More compellingly and more inspiringly. The reason I was moved to tears, the, 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 this Pentecostal preacher that I was telling you about, mm -hmm. he said he was driving down some freeway and he said, you know, he started to cry and he had to pull over. And oh. it was because of Catton's generosity of soul. Wow. The reason he was crying not was because no, it was not because of fear. It was because William Catton writes with such a generosity of soul that he just evaporates the blame game. You can't you know, play. He did. He did. He talks about it in the book about not well, essentially blaming our the people that came before us. This was an expectation of our of our of the time that people would do better they didn't know it was wrong early on early on burning fossil fuels at least on moss no exactly i mean that was the thing that struck me most and mm -hmm. has consistently struck me every single time i've reread it every single time i've re-listened to it it's it, it it puts me in the place of oh of course of course of course of course, of course, of course, our species went this way because he shows how overshooting carrying capacity has happened in many other species. Mm -hmm. It's not, un humans aren't uniquely evil. We're not uniquely bad. We're not uniquely stupid. We're doing what biological or organisms tend to do. Yeah. And understanding that just completely evaporated. And once I realized that population pressure is at the root of most things that we judge in terms of politically or socially, you know, racism, sexism, thisism, nationalism, thatism, thisism, you know, all the kinds of things that we tend to play the blame game on mm -hmm. can be understood and should be understood fundamentally as expressions of population pressure. And when, you, when I really got that, as he makes so clear in this book, I found that my blame game dropped away. I found that my mm -hmm. compassion just skyrocketed because I, because people I used to blame and judge, I started feeling compassion for because, oh, my God, mm -hmm. we're all in this together. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I, I cannot mm -hmm. speak too highly about this book. And and I want to, uh, you know, there's many things, and I'll, I'm happy to take questions or whatever. Oh, yeah, we're going to do one that. Of the, one of the most important concepts in this book, in addition to, well, actually, there's two things I want to say, and then I'll just stop, and then we'll just spend, spend time in Q&A and response, because I don't want to just keep just blabbering. Oh, it's not blabbering, Michael. Sorry. Well, no, I, I still, I, I, I want to be in the place of responding to folks. and But I will say this, that, that, that there's a, I did a course a few years ago called Pro Future Faith. And unfortunately, it costs money for the DVDs. I mean, I actually have all of the videos on it in a Dropbox box. So if anybody sends me an email, michaelbdowd at gmail.com, I'm happy to give you the link to the, my Dropbox box so you can get it for free. But this course, Pro Future Faith, is it, I spoke to about 300 people in a huge liberal uh, Methodist really cathedral it was a cathedral in downtown houston and they had three tv cameras on me so they got lots of great shots it was amazing but i do this five minute introduction to catton's fundamental distinction or fundamental understanding of that we what he called really the unfathomable predicament of yeah. mankind so the unfathomable predicament of humankind, meaning we don't recognize it, and it's not a problem that can be solved. It's a predicament that we can't solve. we got to deal with it. And that whole section of the book, the unfathomable predicament of humankind, here's my little five-minute segment or four-minute segment of like what I, how I would interpret that. That 
We are biological organisms just like any other biological organism. We're dependent upon air, water, soil, forest, life, other life. And there's a, there's a limit. There's a grace limit. There's a carrying capacity that if we exceed that carrying capacity, that is if we use too many resources or if we exude too much waste, the systems start breaking down. And that's true for all species. Europe, during the... During the the 600, 700, 800, 900, 10, you know, 1,000, you know, a period of about 1,000 years, Europe was in a slow decline in terms of carrying capacity. Europe, the forests were being wiped out, the other species were being wiped out, but it was happening slowly. It was happening over many, many, many centuries. This is after Rome's collapse. And then when the Europeans that were in intense population pressure, so there was all these wars going on in Europe, in the 14th uh, and 15th centuries. When the New World, when the whole Western Hemisphere, the whole, I mean, uh, half, a, half a planet practically was discovered. Now, of course, it was fully occupied by indigenous peoples. But it, when it was discovered by Europeans, it appeared to be an uninhabited continent. Full of with bigger trees, more trees, more fish, more animals of every kind, more resources of every kind that allowed humans to flourish than Europe had seen in over a thousand years. And because of the diseases that many of the Europeans brought over with us, I say us because I'm European descent, wiped out 90% of the indigenous Americas. Now, of course, that happens sometimes by, by evil, by class passing on dirty blankets and that sort of thing, you know, blankets that had uh, smallpox and other diseases. My point being is that when most Europeans had to interact with Native Americans, it was 10% of what had been here. And so it appeared from the European perspective and the arrogant uh, uh, anthropocentric worldview that the Christian worldview that the Europeans came with, it appeared to be an uninhabited continent, and these were just heathens. They just needed to be treated like savages, you know, animals. Mm. And and so, from the European perspective, there were more resources than Europe had experienced in over a thousand years, well over a thousand years. There was a relief of population pressure in Europe because millions of Europeans came to this continent. Most of the natives died out because of the diseases, and then those that didn't were forced on rev reservations and everything else. I don't want to even talk about that evil right now, but it was evil. And then coal, oil, and natural gas were discovered. These incredible, dense, concentrated, easily portable, energetic resources that Earth had sequestered over millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, were discovered and burned. So, two things. One, an uninhab a seemingly uninhabited co continent, a continent full of resources, and then fossil fuels. And so what that did is that most Americans and Canadians and other people from the Western Hemisphere, but most Americans, developed a mindset of limitlessness. There was limitless possibilities, limitless resources, yes. limitlessness in every possible conceivable and way. I want, I want, I want. And it instilled over several generations this sense of entitlement, this sense of inevitability of progress, this sense of, uh, of an abundant universe with more than enough resources, more than enough ability to handle all of our waste, and et cetera. The institutions, and the laws that got formulated in North America all reflected that sense of limitlessness. Mm -hmm. And then we exported that all over the world. So now yeah. the people of India and China and Bangladesh and everywhere else in the world have this expectation, of course, that this is being fostered by our media and our multinational corporations and everything else, this, this sense of limitless possibilities. And yet, all of that was forged in an area of what's called carrying capacity surplus. That is more than enough energy, more than enough resources. But that's not the world we actually live in. We actually live in a world of carrying capacity deficit. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough energy. 
And yet the expectations and the mindset and the institutions reflect carrying capacity surplus. And what Catton calls that is the unfathomable, that is, we don't get it, predicament, not a problem, it can't be solved, predicament of humankind is that we have, we actually live in a world of carrying capacity deficit. We're in decline, we're in mm -hmm. collapse. Yet we have the expectations and beliefs, and, and it's reflected in our United Nations charters and everything else, of carrying capacity surplus. of, and, and, and that's a predicament. And there's no book that has instilled more compassion and generosity and understanding of our predicament for me. Mm -hmm. And Connie and so many others, Derek Jensen, Paul Ehrlich, so many others, oh, uh, uh, Dave, Dave Foreman, and Max others. Wilbert, Max Wilbert, exactly, exactly. So anyway, so the, the only other thing I want to say is cargoism, because the big thing is that if you don't understand William Catton's overshoot, if you don't have the ecological paradigm that, frankly, in my experience, can only occur from reading or listening to Overshoot. Mm -hmm. I don't know of another source that provides the entire worldview of ecology as theology, what I'm calling, he didn't call it this, but ecology as theology, that, that is ecology as everything to reality. Okay. If you don't have that, it's almost impossible in the 21st century to not fall victim to what Catton calls cargoism. And cargoism is the belief that technology and the market can still save our asses. That if we just yes. have the right technology, if we just have enough solar panels and and wind turbines and and you know and and fusion energy, if, you know, if we can just shift things technologically and the market, green economy, green economics, if we can just do that, then we can still have this cornucopian future. Yeah. And that is such a delusion. And it's based on this understanding that the Melanesians had where mm. there were these during World War II, if you're not familiar with the term cargo cult, during World War yes. II, there were these islands that had these these uh, these natives and and then these americans came with all these planes and these resources and and these native american the, these native these indigenous peoples of the melanesian islands were trying to figure out where's all this cargo coming from where's all this technological stuff coming from and they imagined that it was probably coming from people like them that were being enslaved in these other countries. Mm. And so they had this whole mythic, supernatural, uh, superstitious worldview that if they just built the right runways and they built the right sort of receiving systems, then these cargoes, these planes would start arriving to them. In other words, they didn't understand how technology works. They didn't understand how cargo, how the things of mm -hmm. the world are being yeah. made. And that's what Catton says, that if you don't get the ecological paradigm, it's almost impossible to not fall victim to the myth of perpetual progress. It's almost impossible to not believe in eco-modernism, of, of cargoism, of techno-utopianism, of, of that technology and the market are going to save our asses, even though the truth of the matter is that technology, human innovation, and the market is what got us into this mess. Yes. The essence of sustainability is preserving the living world as the primary responsibility. Yeah. The essence of unsustainability is transform the living world into human benefit and then measure benefit and wealth in human-centered terms. And if you don't understand the distinction between sustainable, genuinely sustainable cultures and unsustainable civilizations, and if you don't understand that technology and the market are the cause of our ills, not the sort, not our way forward, then you're just gonna you're just gonna completely be delusioned in terms of what gives you hope. And that's why Catton's book is, in my opinion, if you only read one book the rest of your life, okay. please take the time to read or listen to William Catton's Overshoot. Well, End thank of sermon. You. <laughs> Okay, but that's all right. I want to segue because I want to go to Jennifer now and say, Jennifer, 
when you first read it or listened, I, you know, my, I listened to it uh, with Michael. Um, I have the book, but I, I yeah. listened. How did you feel? What did you feel about this? Well, what was your experience? Well, what I, what I felt was that, you know, with great truth, it's so simple. And when I read it, it was like drinking water. It yeah. was like so natural. And it was go. like, I've always known it. And that's what I yes. found with great yes. truths is that it just assimilates into your being. And then all of a sudden, you've always known it. Oh, There's never yes. been a time you've always you known didn't. It. Oh. Correct. You've always known it. Right. All knowing. Yeah. All knowing. Yeah. Oh. And then another thing that I really like to do when, because this book is rich and it's dense and it yeah, has every so page many... has every paragraph almost is worth like reading twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another thing that I really like to do, this may not be what other people like to do when they read, but I like to read on my Kindle. And one of the best things about that is I highlight, there were so many characters that mm -hmm. I didn't know secretaries of state, sociologists, chemists, environmental thinkers, archaeologists, all these different people, most of them I've never heard of, you know, just highlight it. Then all of a sudden I go into Wikipedia, I read about it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Then, you know, one thing leads to another, then I go back to the book. That's how I like to do it. And the wow. reason I like to do it is, and I learned so much about everything really mm -hmm. everything that he discussed at a deeper level and it made it more relevant it wasn't just like meaningless yes. information that kind of came through my brain and washed out all of a sudden i knew about these people and i knew about these movements and these places yes. and it was so ultimately fascinating um just just amazing and i i love this book i'm gonna read it again you might do I, what I you're know. doing michael and read it every year how you could not like it but you know we we have one thumbs down so obviously somebody doesn't like it on youtube oh, well i'd like to say that that thumbs down <laughs> was there when this talk started oh so that's the obligatory got... thumbs down from whatever troll or it's a trolly <laughs> thing they, they, we always get like two or three thumbs down so we have two or three trolls trolls out there they just like to diss whatever it is that we or it's talk an about. algorithm who knows well who yeah knows? but but the it's other thing the, the other thing to important that's important to remember and and i think uh, for me it helps me to remember it with a sense of compassion is that for people for whom they genuinely believe like they genuinely believe that humankind is the pinnacle of evolution we are what it's all been leading to right. yeah those, those people are going to have a profound challenge with oh. cat and well, this, or well, for people for whom yeah for people for whom they genuinely can't let in the possibility much less the inevitability of civilizational collapse or they can't let in the possibility of of homo sapiens much less homo colossus but of of our species going extinct anybody who's in that place and there's a lot of people that are emotionally in that mm -hmm. place all of us on this yeah. conversation i suspect have been in that mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. and something shifted us but i think it's deserving for us for those who aren't there yet where we are for those who still hold out hope for technological salvation, those who still believe humans are the be-all and end-all of the universe, those who still believe that evolution is all about us, those who still believe that it can't possibly be the end of humanity, much less the end of industrial civilization, those who still believe that progress is inevitable, they're going to have a difficult time with this book. They're going to have a really... So the, oh, yeah. I expect thumbs down from those folks, oh, yeah. especially if they haven't read it. Of course, if they read it, they'll be convinced by Catton himself because he writes with such generosity of soul. 
he does. And, and 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 when I listen to it, when you read it, and I've listened to it like three times over the last how many months? Because I'm, I, you know, knowing we were going to do this. Plus, I've done the we we did our first uh, discussion together, Jennifer, you and I, and yeah. I did the uh, the beautiful video on Frank Rotering's yes. interview with William Catton. So we've covered him extensively, but he is he is kind of like a baseline. For for our channel actually and then i look at bright green lies and i think that that's like it's it's the 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 succession of of telling it like it is right. baby like it is absolutely and since you mentioned that sandy i just want to go on record on this broadcast that bright green lies is a book that just was published last month mm -hmm. uh max wilbert lear keith and Derek jensen are the three co-authors and there's also now a hour and 10 minute, I think it's long, documentary called mm -hmm. Bright Green Lies. Yep. Beautiful. And both the book and the documentary are, in my experience, must read, must see. Yes. And all three of them, Lear Keith, Max Wilbert, and, and Derek Jensen, all three of them hold William Catton's Overshoot as one of the most significant, Absolutely. if not the most significant book they've ever read. I had uh, Max on the show and he was a beautiful guest and it, it was so feeling because my roots yeah. are activism and yes, in, exactly. you know, pipelines and environmental activism. And I, I just, um, <sighs> yeah, he, he's out there right now I at, at Thacker Pass, uh, uh, you know, I know. really, uh, really tr uh, pr opposing this lithium mine, because the, the truth of the matter is, and I'll, I don't want to go on record saying this, the truth of the matter is that the promotion of green energy, green capitalism, eco-modernism, technology, all this stuff, oh, delusional, but you won't get that if you don't read Catton's Overshoot and other things like Bright Green Lies, especially Bright Green Lies. They yeah. just devastate that. And, and why that's so... I, I, I want to use a religious term that most of your listeners are probably going to freak out by, but I want to use the word demonic. And, and I don't mean anything otherworldly or supernatural. What, what I mean by demonic is any, what I define as evil is pursuing one's self-benefit, whether, whether it's one's individual or one's corporation or one's nation, pursuing self-benefit in ways that you know are harming the future. Yeah. That's evil. But any system, any economic and political system that makes it easy or inevitable for millions of people to harm the future simply by pursuing the good life, well, if the word demonic doesn't apply to that, nothing. I mean, the word demonic has no meaning in a modern world. Right. And what Bright Green Lies does and what Catton's Overshoot does is it, it, it's like that scene in at the end of uh, uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, where the, the curtain is removed and you, you see the, you know, the, the old guy there as Oz, you know, it's like it removes the curtain. You realize, yeah. oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. It's like, of course, of course, of course we're in this position. And of course, of course, of course, all these techno-optimists and the Steven Pinkers of the world and all the people who are still benefiting from the system and are still promoting progress. Of mm -hmm. course, of course, of course they're doing that. <laughs> so the judgment, the blame, the anger starts to evaporate. The compassion comes in. And then we can start seeing clearly about where we can make a difference. What still is possible, not transforming the system, not saving industrialism, mm -hmm. but what still is possible is we can be amazing blessings to our community to our families to our neighbors to our community mm -hmm. there's so much good work to do that nourishes our souls and blesses others exactly and that's where it's at and that's what the climate mobilization is all about local action because exactly. you know when you come down to it that's all you got and even if it's city blocks organizing exactly. that way for to, to make sure that your city block whatever you meet your neighbors you guys do things in the in in community gardens whatever you can do and i'm sure exactly. william would agree with that yeah it, it, it all comes down to to support and to um contending with the predicament and as mo emotion is transferable you know like sandy you were breaking down in tears when you were hearing michael contending with this we're contending with the predicament 
And we're going to be going through, and we are going through a massive process of understanding and contending with this. And it brings up every single thing within you, you know? Right. So I think if, if we have any missions at all, it is to contend with predicament and to become aware the best we can and to spread that truth and awareness because other people are going to have to contend with this. And the ironic thing is we're so close now to the end. We understand that the Arctic is just about done. We understand what the implications of this is. Right. And yet, at the same time, it's all hidden, you know. Yeah. And, the, and, 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 and that's why that's why my life is committed, as the two of you know, my life is committed to nurturing a post doom heart, yes. mind, and action in people, love and action. Because doom is all about fear, urgency, uh, direness. Uh, yeah. Oh, fuck, we're so fucked. All this kind of intense energy. And yet the post-doom space, first of all, you can't get there without going through doom, so you, you got to go through that stuff. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, a post-doom space is that place of understanding. It's the place that Catton provides. It's the place that uh, Derek Jensen and, the, you know, the, the Eric Keith and Max Wilbert's book, Bright Red Green Lies. It's that place of understanding that no... Techno solutions, economic solutions, market solutions, human ingenuity solutions are no solutions at all. That we're in a predicament. We're not in a problem that can be solved. We're in a predicament we have to adapt to. And this is the most amazing time for human generosity, compassion. Uh, yes. One of the things I point out that a lot of people don't know that you only figure out when you actually study side by side previous collapsed civilizations, as I've been doing for the last eight years, thanks to John Michael Greer and Toynbee and Spengler and so many others, but is that in, in previous collapsing civilizations, you find over and over again, saints, sages, heroes, sheroes are born. People who are committed to the common good, committed to being a blessing to the community without in any way denying collapse. And so there's so much opportunity for joy. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm working on an article right now that I, I will probably deliver in a, uh, a TED Talk uh, here in the next couple of months mm -hmm. that I'm titling. The, 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 the conference is titled Living Brightly. And I've at first I questioned, like, do you really think I'm the right guy to address this? I mean, I'm sort of don't known as, you know, Mr. Reverend Post Doom, you know. And, <laughs> and and the organizer said, No, 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 Michael, I've watched your stuff. You're great. You're exactly what we need. And so I I've been thinking a lot about this. And I thought about a title, The Big Picture. Hope free joy. At Tiatawaki. Tiatawaki, of course, is the yeah. end of the world as we know it. Tiatawaki. So post doom joy at Tiatawaki. And I think that's where we are because when we find the joy of serving others, of being a blessing to others, of simply being present to the fucking awesomeness of every day, <laughs> like for somebody to just be present on a day by day basis yeah. of the joy of being and alive and conscious and to be able to feel grief. Just yes. to be able to feel the grief of other species. I mean, sure. Can we focus on everything we're losing and feel pissed off? Sure, of course. But can we also feel joy at like, oh, my God, I get to be alive at this incredible time in human history? Yeah. And that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Catton's generosity of soul is like a almost a sled ride into that place of yeah. compassionate, of course, of course, of course, understanding, and then emerging on the other side of doom to the place of post-doom contribution. And that's why I love this book so much. Well, thank you. I think it's time for questions and answers. I'm sure. I think it's time for interaction. So, um, right. I, and Jennifer, you got some very lovely compliments out of the chat from the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I can't Trish see the chat. Ladies. Just so people know, I I'm, will I'm put, on a screen. It's okay. I, I can't will see the chat. I will put the questions up for you. 
and okay. read them to because you. Because when I had the chat open, I was getting two different audios. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah, to, can't I do that. that I understand right. that happens. Okay, so the first question uh, I I um was from Captain Nemo. Question: Does Reverend Michael have ties to uh, Wrigleyville, Chicago history? Never heard of it. Nope. Okay, that's that one. And how about uh, we go to Lorax Tribe? Thank you all for your generosity, Lorax Tribe. How do we maintain a pro-sustainability, responsible action attitude in face of this future of doom? I think we covered it a little, but yeah, let's well, go. I've, 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 I'm, I'm grateful for Lorax Tribe's contributions on the Reddit sub, the subreddit collapse. Oh, and good. So I'm familiar. Uh, I will say this. How do we, uh, I forget what the question was. How do we maintain a, yeah, a pro sustainability, sustainability yeah. responsible action attitude in the face of this future of doom? In a word, love. Loving life love. as if it were God. Loving life, loving the biosphere as if it were divine. Like, like mm -hmm. that devotional love, that sense of transformational love, almost erotic, but service, this, this deep service, this deep reverential love for life in all of its forms, the trees, the birds, the shrubs, the, the, whatever is in your bioregion, to fall more deeply in love with the life forms of your bioregion as if it were divine. That's the thing that all indigenous cultures had in common, is a treating the biosphere in all of its particulars as if it were God. That is, as a greater thou, as our biophysical, spiritual, material, creator, sustainer, and end, not merely as resources to be used. And so we can all develop that. We can. All, I, I did this, Connie and I spent close to three hours hiking today. And we, we, because it was an 80 degree day, we went to this place. Connie's assisting trees and migrating. She's doing this. She's the leading point people in North America of assisted migration, assisting trees and migrating faster than any other animal can move their seeds. And so we went and looked at pawpaw trees. Uh, 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 and, and it was just such an amazing day. And I literally set like probably six, 10 times during the day. I just sat in one place, sometimes mm -hmm. with my feet in the in this little river, and I just like went soft eyes. So I was like in a meditative space. I consider meditation simply paying attention to the speed of life. That's my definition of meditation, paying attention to the speed of life. And I was just nurturing a love relationship as if this living biosphere that I'm experiencing right now with these trees, these shrubs, these this river, this whatever as if this is God conspiring, loving me. And this is God loving everything, not just me, because it wasn't Michael centered or human centered. And I was in a, I was in a place of ecstasy. I was in a place of bliss by simply nurturing, consciously nurturing a deeper love relationship with the biosphere. And so I encourage everybody to do that. That's one way that we can nurture a pro future, pro sustainability, uh, consciousness and actions, even in the midst yeah. of collapse and, and, and contraction. And, and uh, because we can't, here's the thing. Here's where I disagree with Guy McPherson as, as highly as I regard him. And I count him as a dear brother and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, somebody who's contributed enormously to the space mm -hmm. where I disagree with him is that we can't know with ultimate certainty, whether 50 years from now, there will be no humans or, whether 50 years from now, there'll be 7,000 pockets of 100 to 150 humans in different places around the world. We can't know that. And so let's live our lives accepting our mortality as if we could all go extinct, because that's a real possibility, but also contributing as if we're planting seeds for a healthy humanity living once again, to myth, speak mythically, in the garden, once again living in right relationship to reality and an intimate rapport with the biosphere as Gaia, as God, as goddess. Okay. Jim Massa, our teammate, Jim. Jim. He, Jim is here. Okay. Science Talk with Jim Massa question. What is Rev's opinion of Paul Ehrlich, especially his Population Time Bomb book he published in the 70s. He was excoriated at that time. But in my view, he has been exonerated. 
I fully agree, Jim. And the reason he was excoriated at the time is that we couldn't have predicted what's called the Green Revolution. Turns out that the Green Revolution is the most devastatingly stupid thing we've ever done in terms of overshoot. All right. we did was perpetuate and make sure that our, our collapse would be all the more horrific. But, um, but, 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 but yeah, but, but again, what Catton provides and, and what John Michael Greer and a few others provide as well mm -hmm. is a sense of, oh, of course, of course, of course, Paul Ehrlich was demonized. And of course, of course, of course, that people still to this day poke fun at him. And of course, of course, of course, that he's ultimately right. Yeah, he is. Pretty heavy. He is. Well, thank yeah. you, Michael. Let but, it, you see. know, I just want to say, yes. Michael, it takes a great deal of courage to go into this space and to keep at it because you are going to get people reacting to you in the worst of ways and calling you Absolutely. names and demonizing well, and when, you. And when you've been at it as long as Paul Ehrlich has, I mean, right? Exactly. I, I encourage in addition to reading William Catton's Overshoot, which obviously I'm encouraging everybody to do. But I also encourage folks to go to the postdoom.com website postdoom.com easy to find mm -hmm. and make a spiritual and i'm not meaning anything supernatural or otherworldly i'm meaning just make it committed commitment yeah commit to spend two or three months watching or listening to the stuff on the post doom website it will nourish your soul your inner being your essence it will help you move through doom to this place of post doom contribution post doom compassion post doom generosity and and there's lots of stuff. i mean i interviewed paul ehrlich i i mean they featured it on the the mob the, the website but there's so many awesome interviews and I don't want to lift it's, any one yeah. above the other, but I mean, my interview with Jennifer was absolutely yes, it was. I did because she was so impressed with it. So yeah, go to the Post Doom website, watch or in fact, within the next week, literally within the next probably five to seven days, all of those YouTube videos will also be available on SoundCloud oh, and cool. probably uh, and probably Apple uh, uh, mm -hmm. iTunes as well. We're going to have them available as, as downloadable audios because a lot of nice. people don't have time to sit in front of an hour long video, but people can listen that they can download audios to their iPod. Yeah, and you can and garden listen. and so listen. The, <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. Headset, and there's 75, <laughs> there, yeah, there's 75 post doom conversations, wow. but Amazing. do make sure that you read, do make, go, go to the post doom.com website and read the okay. three definitions of doom and the three definitions of post doom. So you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, let's segue to the next question. And this is a good one from Lightning Rod up in uh, Canada. What was the most eye-opening revelation from the book? Something you didn't know before you read it. And I'm going to give this to Michael and to Jennifer. Wow. Well, for me, it really was the unfathomed uh, uh, um, uh, predicament of humankind. I had never had anybody lay out what we're dealing with as a species that we can't avoid mm -hmm. we can't solve but that made so much freaking sense that i was like oh my god of course of course of course and it was that mm -hmm. sense that we live actually in a world of carrying capacity deficit yet we have mindset institutions and expectations that reflect carrying capacity surplus. Mm -hmm. And that was so insightful that I, I literally was moved to tears and I was like, oh my God, this changes everything. Because understand, if you don't understand the distinction between living in a time of exuberance, ecological and emotional exuberance, and living in a post-exuberant time, a time of yeah. ecological scarcity, a time of decline, if you don't get that distinction, then you're going to probably misjudge and mischaracterize mm -hmm. and misinterpret damn near everything. That's why for me, the dividing line, like my line in the sand is people who've read Catton and people who haven't, because if you haven't wow. read Catton, if you, if you don't have an ecological worldview, you're going to misdiagnose yeah. and misinterpret damn near everything. 
Yeah. yeah, you make them. And I know that sounds like a fundamentalist, and I apologize for that, but it's still the truth. It's still my belief. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, it took all the guilt out. And I had never thought of comparing humanity to a culture of yeast that you put in wine that just naturally <laughs> keeps going and going and gets so clever and finds new ways in the yes, green revolution to absolutely. go, 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 go. <laughs> and also just uh, like denies it the whole time, denies that we're actually in overshoot. Like there were still kind of fooling ourselves that we're in a state of exuberance. We're way past exuberance. We're exactly. so close to the end, but the thing is, just like yeast multiplies and exponentiates, so does humanity. And you can't see where you are until it hits you in the face. And by then it's too late. You know, like the day before the yeast, if, if the yeast multi multiplies and doubles every day, the day before it fills the entire, quote, yeast culture, you know, whatever, Petri dish or whatever it is, it's only 50% the day before so i mean we exactly. are way past the 50 percent. we are just like two seconds to midnight and it's still hidden and it's so mysterious and to me that makes this time that we're living in so much more profound because we are piercing the veil as are so many people all over the world that are yes, grokking exactly. this exactly. and those that have pierced the veil and that are actually seeing what the hell is happening are demonized because people are scared of that. Of course. Right, exactly. So why wouldn't they be? True. Why wouldn't they and yet, be and yet it's so it's, it, it's hard for many of us who get collapse, who get overshoot, who get resource depletion, who get decline, who get, you know, the very real possibility, not the inevitability, but the very real possibility of near-term human extinction. It's very difficult for those of us to get all that. Stay towards those who are still in a progress trap, those who are still believing in, 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 in technology, the market, whatever. And yet I suggest that not only will our lives be more fruitful and joyous if we do get to that place of compassion, but also we'll make it effortless. We'll make it almost inevitably effortless for our loved ones to come to a more post-doom place by not judging them for being in the place of progress or, you know, whatever. And so it, from a purely pragmatic standpoint, I encourage people to read Catton so that you can apply his generosity of soul to your own life in your own relationship to your friends, families, neighbors, and colleagues right. well let's go with jimmy john and jimmy john asks is climate change a cover-up for population overshoot wow that's a hairy one yeah no i think they're both they're both completely related i mean they're they're one they're you know sort of two two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. population overshoot climate change, abrupt climate change, resource depletion. I mean, this is the thing. In one of my most recent videos, actually in three of my most recent videos, I think, one of them is called Irreversible Clap, Irreversible Collapse, How We Can Still Avoid Evil or something like that. The other one is called Unstoppable Collapse, How to Avoid the Worst. And then my most recent video, which I actually recommend, is the top video that I would recommend people in terms of if they're interested in how I think think about things and the resources that I've drawn mm -hmm. is called the big picture the big. clarity compassion and love and action the big picture clarity compassion and love and action I think in all three of these I talk about this sense of of uh, that that if people focus on climate change they're focusing on a symptom Richard Heinberg famously said, climate change is mm -hmm. not our biggest exactly. problem. Overshoot yeah. is. Yeah, and global exactly. warming is just the symptom of overshoot. And so if you don't get overshoot, you don't get that all these other things are merely symptoms of that. That's right. That's right. I couldn't agree more. I, I totally agree that um, climate change is a symptom. It's a result. Yeah of the carrying capacity being exceeded in huge amount for, you know, just like at such a steep curve. And of course, climate's gonna give 
food's going to give, everything's going to give, but it's all because of overshoot. And, and yes, and what I make, the point that I try to make in all three of those videos, I think I try to make it in all three of those videos, is that what causes overshoot, what causes, eco, what causes overshoot of carrying capacity is fundamentally anthropocentrism, human-centeredness. Mm -hmm. It's having a human-centered rather than a life-centered understanding of wealth, progress, development, everything else. I mean, the idea of development, the idea of taking the living world, the biosphere, and not preserving it in its integrity, but changing it for human benefit, this is ultimate insanity. There are yes. terms, there are words that we use like growth, development, um, progress, that are ultimately insane if we interpret them in human-centered terms. The only sense of growth, progress, development that make any sense whatsoever is from a life-centered term. So I see anthropocentrism, human-centeredness, mm -hmm. human-centered measures of progress and well-being, for example, as the fundamental issue that there is no possibility of sustainability if we don't measure progress in terms of how well is the soil doing decade by decade? How yeah. well is the for how well the forest doing decade mm -hmm. by day? What are the other species doing decade by decade? What's the carbon in the atmosphere decade by decade? What's the acidification of the oceans decade by decade? That's the only measure of progress that makes any sense whatsoever. And we're actually doing the opposite of that. We're measuring progress and well-being in terms of how individuals, corporations, and nations are doing. This is ecocidal. This is insane. Um, Michael, did you interview Christine Mattis? I had her on, uh, what night? Friday night. And I would suggest you watch her. She writes for Counterpunch and for, um, um, what's the other one? Common Dreams. And she Well, you know something? A, it's interesting because yeah, she's this a is PhD the second, in, yeah, this is the second time in a week that her name has come up to me. No, I've not interviewed okay. her. Well, definitely no, I'm not watch. even deeply familiar with her work. So, okay. yes, I'll watch. Watch, yeah. and I will send you a link with her, with the work, her cadre of articles. She was a really, it was a really nice guest, and I loved it. Um, climate marcher Happy John had a question. Uh, how's Connie doing? Can you update us on her assisted migration and ecosystem restoration projects? Oh, John, I love you, brother. Yes, Connie and I supported the Great March for Climate Action in 2014, where there were like 50 marchers that marched from mm -hmm. Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., about 14, 15 miles. And John mm -hmm. was one of them. And mm -hmm. so, yes, I know who John is. So, yes, C Connie's work has really skyrocketed. Uh, her work in assisting trees and migrating. There was a major book that came out called The Journeys of Trees, by Zach St. George. It was a major pub. I mean, Norton, yeah. W.W. W. Norton is one of the top publishers in the world. And they published The Journeys of Trees, uh, a story about forests, people in the future. And it featured my wife, Connie Barlow, from the very first sentence throughout the entire book. So, yeah, it, it's really raised her profile. And she's now working with indigenous people, indigenous scholars, indigenous naturalists, and, and foresters. And her work in assisting trees has really taken uh, uh gone front and center and and yeah she does this pretty much every day for the whole morning while we, we both have caffeine brain i i make um strong mocha so i make like strong coffee with with dark chocolate and while she's on mocha brain she, he, she does her assisted migration work but yeah thanks All for right. asking john all right Beautiful. pete soderman question michael nice to see oh, you pete. Uh, oh, what you, uh, do, what do you say to someone who's a dedicated cargoist technologist, or do you just let it go? Uh, uh, how do you try to get through? That's a great question, Pete. I usually don't. I, 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 I do little forays. I do little sort of things. And if they are still really solidly in a cargoist technology in the market, it's going to save us. I don't waste my breath. I just okay. love them exactly as they are and exactly as they're not. Because if I if they feel loved by me and accepted by me rather than judged by me, mm -hmm. it's going to make it infinitely easier six months, a year, two years from now for them to come closer to my position because they don't have all that shit to get through of my judgment. So, yeah, I just Aww. pretty much accept them. That's yeah. awesome. All right. That's well, exactly what you. you counsel 
with us last time that yeah. we met Michael mm. because I was kind of moaning about, you know, Oh, Michael I Mann's my, book, right? I sure, was yeah, moaning yeah. about yeah, we it. I was like, I was upset. I was insulted. <laughs> I was like all, yeah, all sorts sure. of things. And you actually helped me through that. Well, well, thank you for saying thank that, Jennifer. You. And it's important to honor our own feelings. The fact that you felt betrayed or, you know, whatever by we Michael did. Mann, that makes sense too. So, so just don't be gentle with yourself. But mm -hmm. yes, I, I just assume sort of one of my fundamental principles for going through life is assuming that most people are doing the best they can given what they've got to do work with. And if I were them and I had their history, their beliefs and their genes, I'd probably be saying and doing exactly what they are. And that allows me to have compassion for Michael Mann rather than yin, yin, yin judgment. Right. Even, even though I suspect that in the not too distant future, he's going to be a lot closer to where you all and me and Jim Bendel are at. Than <sighs> okay. Uh, he knows. All he knows. right. Dee Dee. Dee Dee asked if, uh, uh, does Reverend Dowd think we could meet our end better if everyone stopped having kids? And now that's a really important and great question. And the answer ultimately is no, uh, but, but, but let me explain the no. Mm -hmm. The no is that mm. we all have to look in the mirror and we have to feel good about ourselves. I mean, this is the fundamental human thing of human nature. And so for some people, they, they decide they're never going to fly again, or they're never going to eat meat again, or they're going to eat less meat. Mm -hmm. or they're going to not have kids or whatever it is. And then they allow that allows them to look in the mirror and they just feel much better about themselves. And that's great. That's important. The truth of the matter is, and this is a painful truth for most of us in this movement to feel and to hear and to accept is that the vast majority of people are never going to stop eating meat. They're never going to stop flying. They're not going to stop driving and they're not going to have to stop having kids because of a sense of responsibility to the future. But for those of us who make those choices, it's often not easy for us to be judgmental. Like if I've, if I've committed to never flying again, it's not easy for me to relate to my friends, neighbors, and relatives who still fly without judgment. If I'm a vegan, it's not easy for me to, to not be judgmental towards my meat-eating friends. If I've chosen to have kids or chosen to accept the fact that my kids have kids or that my grandkids have kids, you know, however old you are, it's not easy for me to not be judgmental. So... Would yeah. the world be a better place if all of us stopped eating meat? Fucking A, of course. <laughs> would, the world, would the world be better if yeah. all of us chose to not fly or drive? Absolutely. Ooh. Would the world be better if like the vast majority of us chose to not have kids? Absolutely. Is it going to happen? No. And so I'd rather, given the fact that we could all die in the next decade or two, from abrupt climate change and blue ocean event and all the rest of it, you know, a multi bread basket failure. I'd rather personally live my life without that kind of judgment that often comes. Plus I got, I got to say this honestly. Okay. So I mm -hmm. got to put all my cards on the table. I live two blocks from my 11 month old granddaughter. Yeah. I yeah, spend you know two hours a day four or five days a week caring for my granddaughter she adds so much fucking joy to my life mm -hmm. so i'm t i'm i'm biased i am not okay. i'm not you can't well, ask me i i'm totally biased on this, this segues <laughs> to basil's question how do you break this news to your grandkids well that's a good question yeah. i i yeah. i don't i mean i don't for example, my, well, obviously my granddaughter's only They're 11 young. months, so it's not an issue now, but I have a 10 month, I have a 10 year old granddaughter. Do I talk to her about near term human extinction? Do I talk to her about the blue ocean event? Do I talk to her about a multi bread basket failure? Fuck no. But I'm committed, just... to, I'm committed to doing the best I can now. She lives in Texas, so I don't have a lot of interaction with her. Okay. But I live two blocks from this granddaughter. So I'm committed to doing everything I possibly can in my lifetime, given my gifts, given my limitations, given my energy, mm -hmm. to ensure that she has the best quality. Anjali is her name. That she has the best quality of life that she could possibly have until the Grim Reaper comes for her and me mm -hmm. and the rest of us. And I, do I honestly believe that my granddaughter will see the age of 25? No, I don't oh honestly believe God. that. 
That's so sad, right? But it's, I it's believe that she can horrible. have. But I believe that she can have a mm. fucking great life mm. for ninety-five percent of it between now and whenever the Grim oh, Reaper comes for her. So oh. I don't speak to my grandkids about this, frankly. Okay. And I don't. And my daughter, who's thirty, who had my okay, she. She watched with me. She 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 came over here and we had a dad and daughter night where we watched my big picture clarity, compassion, and love and action video. The first half of it is super scary. The second half of it is very practical inspiration. And she watched it with me because A, she doesn't want to be in denial about this stuff. And she knows about it because she's, you know, I'm very honest with her. But she also doesn't want to feed, she doesn't go to collapse reddit she doesn't feed her her daily because she wants to be the best mom she can possibly be and 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 i so am a bow of respect and honor to parents and grandparents who don't talk about this shit to their kids and grandkids all right let's segue to dale wover hi dale um question michael dow the relationship of cognitive bias and understanding our predicament and that might be one wow. you and jennifer yeah, no. could tag team this one yeah that's a great question dale I, I i tried to cover this in my video titled i've, I've got a three-part series that i call my collapse and adaptation primer you can find it on the resources page of the post doom website but the second video is called post gloom deeply adapting to reality and I do a whole segment on evolutionary psychology and evolutionary brain science in that video. Um, that's that's quite practical, it, like why we struggle, why we get addicted, why you know all this kind of stuff. And cogn- I do a whole thing on cognitive biases in that program, where I, I bring Michael Shermer is a dear friend and colleague of mine. I mean, I've been to his house several times, and so and he wrote a book on cognitive biases. And so I think there's so much to be learned from how our brains have been structured by evolution to think and pay attention to certain things and to not think and not pay attention to other things that we would do best to honor that and not judge it and critique it and assess it. And so, um, yeah, it's a great question. I deal with it some in that post gloom video. Um, but feel free to reach out to me, Michael B. Dowd at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, let's have a conversation after you watch that. All right. Jennifer, did you want to, um, did you have anything to say on that one? Um, I guess not in particular on that, but I just feel that we're living in such a profound time and that any awareness that we can muster and hold as a space with mm-hmm. compassion and no guilt because it is what it is is going to help okay exactly i fully agree all right now let's go to jim mchenry activist extraordinaire every friday he is doing his gettysburg gettysburg pennsylvania climate protest out there and he is prolific and um michael i also have made a video with jim um, oh i know i watched it just oh, the other okay. Day. So, okay so i can't see his question anymore so please read it all so right I can i'm see going it. to read it how in your opinion should we doomers present the climate change issue in order to get action going and force politicians to act significantly towards uh, avoiding est- extinction and it is good. So first of all, Jim, I'm honored that you asked this question. I am so impressed with the breadth and depth of your knowledge on these issues, which really probably yes. goes significantly beyond mine. Ooh. And I had a significant emotional reaction when I watched uh, the piece that you just did that was just uploaded just a few days ago on Environmental Coffee House, because I don't think our times are urgent. I don't think our time is dire. I don't think that it's an emergency. I don't think that any political action is going to make more than a minuscule difference. I just honestly don't anymore. That's why the, I, I included uh, on the Environmental Coffee House uh, 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 channel mm-hmm. the the eight minute clip from uh, the newsroom in 2014, where the EPA scientist, you know, says, you know, because he's asked by the I newsroom. I should have pulled it you know, up. <laughs> oh God, it's, it is the most important. 
it's the most accurate portrayal of climate change, what we know scientifically about climate change that's ever been done on TV, and it's wow. fake news. It's fake news. It's it's fiction. Yeah. So, yeah. but 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 that eight minute clip is so priceless. I show it in in my evening programs. But but Toby, who's the name of the the EPA scientist, he's asked by by um, Will McAvoy the uh the interviewer at, at, at the cable news seat. so so it sounds like you're saying our situation is dire and he says well no not exactly your house is burning to the ground the situation is dire your house is already burnt to the ground the situation's over mm -hmm. and i think we're honestly in that place i don't think all the activists in the world is not going to, I mean, we are going to see the great conflagration. I, I, I believe that Kevin Hester is on this call, mm -hmm. and I so admire his work with, with Guy McPherson. But the great conflagration of the forests of the world, that is the great burning of the, not all, but the vast majority of forests of the world, that's already unstoppable. We can't stop that. The acidification of the ocean, the dying of the coral reefs, that's unstoppable. We can't stop that. No political action. Not if every human being became vegan tomorrow. Not if we all petitioned and voted the right people in office. There's so many things that are now in unstoppable mode that I personally don't find dire emergency, urgency, or any of that kind of language to be useful anymore. I find what's most useful is taking a deep breath, recognizing that Homo colossus extinction is inevitable, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. in the next 10 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. That the extinction of Homo sapiens is definitely, can't be ruled out, uh, definitely possible. And so where can we make a difference, but from not a place of urgency, and <clears throat> but from the place mm -hmm. of love and action. That's why I prefer, instead of activism, I prefer the term love and action. And I say that with a little bit of humility because you know so much more about these issues than I do. And yet that sense of urgency, that's why the, the two videos that I created, Irreversible Collapse and Unstoppable Collapse, and you don't have to watch them both because there's like a 95% overlap between the content of the two of them. I just basically the Irreversible Collapse I did first. I got some great feedback. Mm -hmm. The Unstoppable Collapse. But, the, but that, that video, Unstoppable Collapse, how we can avoid the worst is my best articulation to date of why I think that sense of urgency and call to action is, is misguided and probably, or possibly at least, going to have us do things that actually exacerbate overshoot. And that's what Catton's book is so much about. It's about helping us to have a paradigm shift so that in our attempt to save things, we don't actually make things worse. Okay. All right. Well, I have another uh, a, a question, and this is from Rick Larson, um, permaculture gardener extraordinaire. Oh yeah. Oh, you should check out his channel. Well, you get some. You got. I know Rick Larson. I mean, I know oh, his work. Okay. This is yeah. Great. Great work. Uh, what? what are the odds that um, s small groups living a peasant lifestyle will make it through the transition? if anything will make it through the transition, those will. I am so in favor of everything. And I go into this in some depth in both the irreversible collapse and unstoppable collapse videos. Basically, I say there are three things that are holy work that, that can keep us from being evil on a geological time scale. One of them is capping the nukes taking the spent fuel rods out of the fuel, out of the swimming pools and putting them someplace like the Yucca mountain. In other words, ensuring as few nuclear mm. and chemical meltdowns mm. that could last for you know thousands or millions of years ensuring as few of those as possible so that's the first thing is as few nuclear and other toxicity issues as possible mm. the second is what my wife's all about moving trees moving shrubs moving plants assisting the living green world in moving faster than any other species can possibly move their seeds the difference between literally thousands of species of shrubs, plants, and trees going extinct this century and those same thousands of species of shrubs, plants, and trees surviving this century is dependent upon one thing and only one thing, which is humans assisting them in migrating. 
So that's holy work. And the third is all about what permaculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture is all about, which is small scale, large scale, however scale, whatever scale you can participate with nature, work with nature, learn from nature as thou, not it. And so all small scale projects in permaculture, uh, 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 the transition towns, anything that's done to build community and more and live more intimately and cooperatively with the land, and in and what I call indigenously. That that is yeah. uh, one of the other videos I'm most proud of that I did is is the third video in my three part series on collapse and adaptation, called Sustainability 101. Indigenuity is not optional. Right. And what I mean by that, it, it's a term that comes from Daniel Wildcat as a Native American elder. But what he means is a, a, applying a native heart and mind, whether you have native blood or not is irrelevant. Applying a native heart and mind, an indigenous heart and mind to problem solving. And that's what permaculture and agroecology and, and you know all this kind of stuff is about. So if anything is going to survive this bottleneck, which we don't know whether it will or not, it will be most likely small scale indigenous and permaculture and all these kinds of regenerative projects. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what's going on here. We're going on an hour and 27 minutes and I think we're going to wrap up. Um, let's see any more. Uh, oh, okay. Here we can end with something good here. What other books do you recommend? Oh, Peter, thank you for the question. And Jennifer, so, pipe in on this one too. Yes, feel free. So just so you know, in 2012, December 3rd of 2012 was when I had my climate come to Jesus moment. Uh, <laughs> I had been a sort of techno-optimist from, I mean, I had an ecological worldview, uh, Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy and a whole bunch of others, you know, throughout the 1980s and 1990s. In 2000, I read several books that put me on a techno-optimist, human-centered worldview. And I pretty much had that until December 3rd of 2012. And on December 3rd of 2012, I watched David Roberts' TEDx talk called Climate Change is Money Up. We both watched it. We both wept. I bought several, half a dozen books that day. And then I started putting myself in the place of being a student, studying climate change, abrupt climate change. And I got to say, Paul Beckwith, Nick Humphrey, meteorologist Nick Humphrey. I mean, the, you know, uh, Kevin Hester, uh, uh, Guy McPherson. Uh, I mean, there were so many people that were writing with a sense of courage in terms of what's really unfolding. Collapse isn't just something that happens gradually. We're in abrupt, irreversible collapse that's actually been unfolding for a couple hundred years in terms of the collapse of the biosphere, but it's actually been in unstoppable mode for the last 50 years. This is what's called the great acceleration, but it's not a great acceleration right, up. Right, right. It's a great acceleration down. <laughs> and, and so um, the books that I've recorded, I've recorded like two dozen books. They're all freely available. They're Great. all they're they're all just up on on SoundCloud. So if you just put Grace Limits, Grace mm -hmm. Limits, yeah. Michael Dowd, you'll get all of my SoundCloud playlists. And and I have my favorite authors, the people who actually I and many others consider like deep sustainability scripture, like the most inspired writings in this field of collapse, abrupt climate change, contraction, overshoot, ecology rise and fall of civilizations, etc., And so all of those can be found free of charge up on SoundCloud, uh, Grace Limits, Michael Dowd, SoundCloud. You'll find them. Okay. Well, Jen, what would you, how would you like to close up uh, the evening? Well, it's been a really profound uh, time here sharing this with you, Sandy and Michael, yes. and I'm so honored that you've spent this time, your life energy, your awareness, your compassion, and your love. Thank you so much for coming in oh and God, guiding yes. us today. And well, I hope you. that you'll consider coming back and joining us in the future. For future oh, this, uh, Jennifer, you and Sandy never need to twist my arm <laughs> to be in a conversation with you about anything uh, that y'all are passionate about. And I just want to say to anybody who's not familiar, like, why am I wearing this weird green clergy shirt? You know, like, well, you are a reverend. 
Well, uh, yeah, I pastored three churches over the course of a decade. I'm an ordained minister, but mm -hmm. I'm committed to ecology as theology. And so this is, it's, I'm, I'm Celtic, I'm Irish. So this is my commitment to the greening of religion uh, and, and really the, the re-divinizing of ecology. And that's why I'm so evangelistic about William Catton's book, Overshoot. All right. Well, I think then that this has been uh, good, great, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank Chuck Diesel for coming in and helping out with uh, the moderating duties. He's a mod on the Ben Dixon show, and I see him on I see him everywhere in the chats. So thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Kim, for being the moderator, and everybody, Hoople's Cat, and Billy Joe Gar Gary. There's too many people to thank, but. Uh, uh, do me a favor. Don't forget that we do have a little um, uh, fundraiser that we have going and I'll do it my little housekeeping here. Become a member um, of Buy Me a Coffee of Environmental Coffee House. And uh, we have good things coming up in the future. We really don't. I don't have anything except. Oh, uh Jim Massa will be with us Wednesday night. Jennifer is going to join me, and I think we're going to be doing Wednesday night lives. Right, Jen? That's right. We're changing from Sunday to Wednesday for the summer. Yeah, it's a bit. We might do, do one Sunday, but it is. Uh, we all have, you know, a life, and COVID is what? waning, and it might give us a little more opportunity. to Yeah, let us hope. Let us hope. And, and, and besides, I have a... A homestead to tend to it's hard to, to 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 handle it all but superwoman here tries <laughs> all right guys well i am going to say good night i hope those of you that didn't catch the beginning um uh go back and watch it and thank you so very much thanks sandy thanks jennifer thank you okay. all okay